When the high dam was built on the banks of the Nile River, it created one of the largest artificial lakes in the world, Lake Nasser. This massive lake covers an area of over 5,000 square kilometers, with an average depth of 180 meters. To put that into perspective, its depth is equivalent to the height of a 60-story building. It posed a significant risk, as it threatened to submerge and destroy more than 18 historical sites located near the dam, including one of the most important of these sites, the Temple of Abu Simbel. The Temple of Abu Simbel is approximately 3,000 years old, and to save this ancient wonder, we had only one solution. That was to embark on one of the most complex and extraordinary relocation and construction operations in modern history. This endeavor has been and continues to be a marvel in the world of engineering and architecture. Hello and welcome to a new video. But before we start, if you're new to the channel, don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell so you can receive our videos right away. The Temple of Abu Simbel was constructed during the reign of King Rameses II of the 19th dynasty, dating back to approximately 1264 BC to 1244 BC. It took about 20 years to complete its construction. The temple was originally hewn into the heart of the mountain, serving as a monumental commemoration of the king, his wife Queen Nefertari, and their achievements during Rameses II's reign. One of the most renowned achievements of Rameses II was his victory in the Battle of Kadesh, celebrated by the four colossal statues adorning the temple's facade. However, one of these statues collapsed due to an ancient earthquake, and its remnants can still be found lying on the ground to this day. Today, within the main hall of the temple, you can witness eight enormous statues of Rameses, four on the right and four on the left. Two additional smaller chambers flank the main hall, designed for storing offerings. In front of the main hall, you'll find the Holy of Holies chamber containing four seated statues, Rameses, Amun-Ra, ra Horakti, and Ptah, the deities responsible for the temple's construction. The temple was meticulously designed with precise astronomical and engineering principles, allowing sunlight to penetrate the inner sanctuary only twice a year, on the king's birthday, October 21st, and the day of his coronation, February 21st. It's essential to note that when we refer to the Temple of Abu Simbel, we are discussing two temples, not just one. One was built by Rameses II for Queen Nefertari, and it stands adjacent to the larger temple. The larger temple has the same architectural layout, but is slightly smaller in scale. Therefore, Egyptologists often refer to them as the Great Temple of Abu Simbel for Rameses and the Small Temple of Abu Simbel for Nefertari. Nevertheless, both temples are regarded as one unified complex. The image of the Great Temple is featured on the Egyptian one-pound note. The pro problem arose with Egypt's decision to build the high dam. The dam posed a threat to the temples, especially the Abu Simbel Temple, as it was at risk of being submerged. At that time, the Egyptian government sought assistance from the United Nations to find a solution to safeguard these archaeological treasures. Experts from over 50 countries gathered to find a solution. One of the proposed solutions was to construct a glass dome around the temple to protect it from water. When the temple would be submerged, visitors could use underwater elevators to observe it and then resurface above the water. However, the idea of the glass dome raised various concerns. For instance, there was the risk of water seepage through the surrounding soil, leading to the temple's eventual collapse, particularly because the temple is situated on sandy soil. Alternative solutions were suggested, including relocating the entire temple using cranes or placing a massive, buoyant structure underneath the temple, allowing it to gradually rise with the rising water level. Unfortunately, None of these solutions were practical, and they carried significant risks. The temple was susceptible to potential damage or destruction, even with the smallest mistake. This led engineers of the time to contemplate another rather unconventional solution, cutting the temple into smaller sections and reassembling it. The idea was to minimize the risks associated with relocating the temple. So, they decided to carefully dissect the temple 
and later reassemble it, similar to assembling building blocks. Initially, before the engineers began any work, they extensively documented the entire area and created detailed architectural plans for every part. This was crucial for future reference. Then, they constructed a temporary dam made of iron plates around the site they intended to work on to control the water levels. This temporary dam was instrumental in providing extra time before the waters could reach the temple site. The breakthrough was not achieved until several months after the water levels had been controlled, and the engineers had constructed a small building in the area called the Kalabsha Temple. This temple was built by the Romans around 30 BC. The engineers decided to use this temple as a test case before cutting the larger Abu Simbel temple. The goal was to evaluate their strategy and make sure it would work before applying it to the more significant and valuable Abu Simbel temple. They successfully cut and relocated the Kalabsha temple. This achievement boosted the team's confidence, proving that their approach was viable. This success gave them the courage to proceed with cutting the larger Abu Simbel temple. The first step in relocating the temple was the precision of the cutting process. It was essential to ensure that the temple could be cut without leaving visible marks on its surface. This was a meticulous process because it was crucial to avoid cutting through facial features, eyes, noses, or other parts of the statues, as this could alter the temple's appearance when reassembled. Yes, throughout the cutting process, some marks are still visible in parts of the statues, but they are not prominent. The overall shape of the statues remains highly acceptable. The cutting process extended beyond the external statues to include columns, ceilings, walls, and engravings inside the temple. Even the top of the mountain in which the temple was carved was cut. All this cutting was done manually because they were concerned that electric saws might cause cracks or led to the collapse of the stone pieces. Additionally, the thickness of the electric saws was relatively large, while the manual saws had a much thinner thickness, ranging from 4 to 6 millimeters. Over 2,000 Egyptian workers and engineers participated in this endeavor. After the cutting process was complete, the two temples were divided into approximately 1,500 pieces. Each piece had an average weight of 20 to 30 tons, and was labeled with a specific code for later reassembly. The plan was to move the temple approximately 210 meters west of its original location, maintaining an elevation of 65 meters above ground level. Despite the relatively short distance, the idea was to keep the temple as close as possible to its original location while elevating it above the reach of the water. The temple was placed on a high mound in its new location. The transportation process itself was exceptionally challenging. The blocks were massive, and they had to be preserved during the moving process to prevent any damage. This was an enormous effort. The assembly process began using iron bars and adhesive materials. They would place the stone blocks on a metal rod, then create holes in the subsequent pieces, and join them together using these iron rods. After that, they would secure them in place. Some pieces were originally cut in a way that allowed them to fit together precisely, like a puzzle, and they were also secured with metal bars at the cut locations. The gaps left from the cutting process were later filled with the stone dust and debris resulting from the initial cutting. Instead of using contemporary building cement, they opted for a special adhesive designed for this purpose. Throughout the transportation and assembly, they took into consideration the solar alignment within the original temple. The sun would enter the temple on specific days of the year. When the temple was relocated, the alignment remained intact, but there was a minor adjustment in the calendar. The phenomenon originally occurred on October 21st and February 21st. After the relocation, it shifted to October 22nd and February 22nd. The colossal effort paid off and the temples were successfully moved from their original location on October 31, 1968. The entire process involved about four years of planning and work, with a cost exceeding $300 million by today's standards. In 1979, the temple was accepted into the UNESCO World Heritage List at its new location. That's the end of the video. 
If you enjoyed it, don't forget to hit the like button.